So this is my short uh, keynote lecture on Desiderius Erasmus and his work, The Praise of Folly, which we're going to go over as part of Unit 1 and the Northern Renaissance. So um, let's start with the man himself. Desiderius Erasmus was a Dutch Northern Renaissance humanist. He was born in the Netherlands, uh, and so uh, he was quite the celebrity of his age. Uh, Erasmus traveled uh, throughout Europe and was often invited to uh, visit and stay with and dine with uh, very famous and prominent rulers. Um, he was known to people in England and in France and in Italy uh, and in Germany and in the Netherlands and in Spain. So he was known throughout Europe. Uh, he was a cleric, but the word cleric back then doesn't uh, or didn't um, imply or carry with it any kind of religious tone. Uh, often a cleric was connected to ministry but that's only because the word cleric was, uh, like today, a civil servant. It was someone who could read and write. Uh, someone who could read and write could be employed in legal matters, could be employed in civic or governmental, or in church or education. And so a cleric was a wide, it was like the umbrella term. Our next slide will look at Erasmus's home. Erasmus was from Rotterdam, uh, which was a major shipping city, and it's not far from Amsterdam. Uh, I, I visited uh, Rotterdam uh, two years ago, and it was a beautiful city. And I tried to find Erasmus's birthplace, but unfortunately it was destroyed in World War II when the Germans uh, bombed uh, Rotterdam. But Rotterdam, back in Erasmus's day, back in the 16th century, Rotterdam was a major shipping city. I mean, it was the city through which everything shipped from other parts of the world, especially from Eastern Europe. A lot of the shipping from Eastern Europe came through Rotterdam. Um, Erasmus was very active as a member of the Brothers of the Common Life. Now, why was this movement so powerful in Northern Germany and the Netherlands. Let's go to our next slide. The Brothers of the Common Life were men and women dedicated to living a life more closely in line with the gospel. Essentially, all the things that we uh, associate with the good news of Jesus Christ. Simple living, daily prayer, and reading the Bible, reading scripture for the purpose of reflecting on it. It wasn't meant to just read it. You had to read it and you had to reflect on it. You had to draw meaning from it. You had to get back to the basics, in other words, of Christian scripture. Scripture was the prime guiding force in the Brothers of the Common Life. The movement was based most strongly in northwest Germany and the Netherlands. The common life, it was known also as the modern devotion, felt that the rituals of the Catholic Church, of course based in Rome, had become too worldly, too concerned with power and wealth. Now I want to point something out. If you were a Catholic living in Rotterdam in the 16th century, or if you were a Catholic living in northern Germany in the 16th century, you, re you were lucky if you even knew who the Pope was. Most people back then associated with their local church. And so for them, when you talked about the Catholic Church, they didn't have this sense of a European-wide movement or organization or institution. When you said Catholic Church, what they thought was the local bishop and the church that they prayed in, the church that they were baptized in, and so on. But if you asked your average German back in the 16th century, hey, can you name the Pope? Most of them couldn't. The Pope was some guy in Rome, far, far, far away, that most people just didn't really have a consciousness of. They didn't go through the day thinking of the Pope. And for them, Catholic identity was their local church, their local bishop. And because of that, loyalty 
and I could even say respect, or maybe not respect, but loyalty and kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, obedience to the uh, Pope was a rather, it was a difficult idea to sell to people who lived in the Netherlands and northern Germany. Who They, they were so far away from Italy that to them, this was, they, like I said, they couldn't name the Pope. They didn't even know who the Pope was, probably. And they would probably die without ever seeing the Pope. And so let's go to our next slide to see how this all comes together. Erasmus wrote the praise of folly as a critique of many things. He, he goes after everything, popular behaviors and qualms as he sees them, you know, things that people did that he thought were silly, folly. But he also goes after theology and what he saw as theology getting too uh, academic. And it was getting away from the love of God and it was getting more into academics. And he also was critical of the Catholic Church hierarchy. But note as you read it that he's writing from the perspective of folly. So he's not hes not the one speaking to the audience. You have to remember that he's writing under the guise of a character, folly, who is like a demigoddess, you know, in the tradition of Greece and Rome. There's your classical Renaissance uh, allusion, by the way. If you notice that, there's your nice connection to the classical Greek and Rome culture in the Renaissance. So it's not Erasmus speaking to the audience. It's the persona of folly. And that's why she's always saying these uh, uh, admirable things of what she respects. Folly likes this stuff. But, so it's, a, it's an example of what we call satire.